Kyle, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Pleasure. Great to be here. So you are a cricketer. You have over 200 caps, two World Cups. You are a Sky Sports commentator. And also you've got this wee side hustle, uh, just a wee bit on the side called being a headmaster of Lurgan College. Yeah, yeah. Uh, probably in the reverse order now. <laughs> um, you know, I'm no longer a cricketer. I retired officially from all cricket uh, at the end of not this season past, but the season previous. Yeah. Um, I still, when asked, do a bit of commentary and a bit of studio work and, and so on. Less so now for Sky, unfortunately. But my day job and my primary job now is headmaster of a great school, Learning College. Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Class. I would like to start actually just by, we've had very different days. We're in very, very different roles. Could you share just a little bit? Because I think your job is, uh, yeah, just you take it from there. Do you know, I come in here and I look at the solace and the peace and the quiet in studio here and I think... <laughs> I want one of these for school. <laughs> um, you a know, safe box. <laughs> a safe box that I can hide away in. No, truth of the matter, my day, you know, I started this morning with the school run with the kids and then I went straight to a Dixon Plan principals meeting um, where I was for about an hour and a half back into school. Um, we have year, year 10 transition evening next week with the, the, the pupils of the junior high school coming to us. I had a meeting with my PA. I had a meeting with my VP. Uh, phone didn't stop. Tried to clear my inbox. Um was getting ready to come here to join you. And we've done a lot of refurbishment in school and I'm really proud of that. The school's a beautiful old school. It's 150 years old. It's absolutely beautiful. And I heard that there was a leak in the ceiling in one of the rooms that we had just recently refurbished and it was a bit of panic station. So I have to say I've, my blood pressure has probably just about settled <laughs> when I've come in here. And now I'm thinking how on earth I could refurbish my office just to be like this. Well, this there you go. Amazing. You know, uh, the, the third member of the team, Mark, he's the genius for a lot sort of stuff. So, you know, we'll send them up and... Make you a, a little place of solace up there. It is a beautiful building. Yeah. And the whole street's beautiful. Yeah. Like I drove past it. I don't know, was it dropping someone off or what was it doing? And I was like, you what? Yeah. It's a wee, it's a wee enclave, wee quiet, you know, in the cul-de-sac there at College Walk. And, the, you know, this, the, the build, we celebrated our 150th anniversary last year. And it's a special, special school with special, mm. special people in it. It always has been. And I'm hoping that it always will be. You know, it's a, it's a heck of a... It's a heck of an honour that they've been bestowed upon me, uh, but it's a it's an honour and privilege. But it's a, I see it as a big responsibility. You know, mm -hmm. I took over from Trevor Robinson, who was there for seventeen years, who did a wonderful job, and I was out with him recently. I just thought, you know, it's almost easier to, to start a job when there's lots of improvement that to be made. You know, um, but I've I've taken over a, a wonderful school, mm. and I'm, I feel very fortunate to be in that position. It's great. I think we're going to spend a lot of time today talking about leadership. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the word responsibility. You carry a lot of it. Mm -hmm. What would you say are some of the things at the very, very top of that list of responsibilities for you as a headmaster? People. I think it's as simple as that. People. Um, that school community. And it's, you know, we, we talk about, you know, that, that, that rope of, you know, three cords, you know, we're made up of our staff, our pupils and our parent body and, and actually the local community. And we try and, you know, we want the walls of the school down so that we're out in the community and the community's in with us. But for me as a leader, through sport, through my teaching career and through everything, it's people. For me, it, it's just as simple as that. It, it, is, it is your ability to deal and get the very best out of yourself and get the very best out of others. And, and the truth of the matter is I'm a big, big fan of... Bronsonism, for want of a better phrase, you know, I, I very much want to um, train my staff up so well that they can leave, but I want to treat them so well <laughs> that they don't wish to. Yeah. Because ultimately, at the heart of schools and society's changing, and schools are complex places, but you know, we're playing such a key role in the lives of young people, and or uh, you know, I want school to play a key role in the community, mm -hmm. um, and you can only do that through people. Yeah. Not with them, you know, through them and alongside them. Um, so for me, at the heart of everything that I've been doing, people are at the heart of it. And treating people as you want to be treated yourself, Yeah, ultimately. I think even Branson was a terrible manager when he started off. We all are. I was just thinking, when's the first time I managed people? We did Young Enterprise in school and we made a wee t-shirt business. And I was the managing director and I was the worst manager ever. <laughs> and it, you know, it taught me every single mistake that I've been repeating since. You know, the, the key for me, there's a massive difference, I think, between being a manager and being a leader. Let's do it. 
Um, so for me, management is an entirely different thing. Mm. And I suppose one of the things, you know, I outlined there that Lurgan College is a school in a really, really good place. And I took it over from a really, really good man who I think took it over from a really, really good man prior to him. So you're walking in the footsteps of all these guys. But I suppose for me, I made a promise to myself that when I took the job on, I would be me. I wasn't going to try to be somebody else. And I, because I, all of a sudden somebody bestowed the, the role of headmaster or principal or whatever, but headmaster in our case, that I didn't want to play the role. I wanted to make sure that I fulfilled the role that people felt that I was capable of doing. And, and in many ways, managers walk the paths that other people have tread before them. Mm -hmm. I think leaders aren't afraid to tread their own paths as well. So it's taking the brilliant and the good that exists and looking at how can I put my stamp on it yep. along not to, well actually that's you know to say to put my stamp on it ultimately as the the headmaster you're the the, the leader and the figurehead but you know it's not my stamp it's it's our stamp in school you know we consult we speak with people we listen to people really actively listen to people and then we try and figure out the best way forward and mm -hmm. yeah it's exciting really exciting i love that a leader is someone who takes who goes to new places mm -hmm. Where do you want to lead the school? Oh, what a wonderful question. We have, obviously the school's 150 years old and it has a, a strong Christian ethos and it has a really strong ethos. And we read the ethos and the first thing I wanted to do was to make it not more contemporary. That sounds like there's something wrong with the ethos itself. And not at all. In fact, I would change a word of it. But we wanted to make it memorable. Um, so we just come up with three Bs. Be ready, be kind and belong. Mm. And we felt that in those three vision statements that we could interweave everything that we wanted to achieve as a school, but actually more importantly, everything our pupils need through school. You know, we need them to be ready for whatever. And if COVID has taught us anything, it's the need to be able to be ready no matter what comes our way. And then the be kind piece is really how we go about it. It's the heartbeat, it's the ethos, it's the lifeblood of the school. And then the belong. Bottom line is, I don't know about your experience at school. Like I wasn't the most academic part. My brother went to Oxford. I was the sporty one who had no interest in academia and I'm all of a sudden the headmaster of a school. The irony in that isn't lost in me. Yeah. But for me, I, sent, I, I, I had an acute sense of belonging in school through sport and therefore it's finding something for every pupil in school because every, you know, every pupil in school, if we base it purely on academic outcomes, they're clearly very, very important. Mm. But there are other values and skills and dispositions and a need to understand lifelong learning and the need for, you're not going to leave school like I did and get a job teaching and stay teaching for the rest of your life. That ability to always look to change and to do better is encompassed in our school motto, mm. Melero Sukor, which is to follow better things, to always look to do things better and to do things different. And I suppose in many respects, when I reflect on my own life to date, that's all I've tried to do. And I've now been placed in a school where that is the, the pulse of the place. Follow so. better things. Mm -hmm. What an amazing thing. Isn't it? Like it really, like ultimately if you live your life trying to follow better things yeah. all the time, <gasps> I think it's fairly, it's a very powerful statement. It's <laughs> the old Latin of Melero Sukwar, it's on our blazers. And, I, and we just felt, you know, that is what we're about. Yeah. So every day in school, I try to go in and if I leave school, is the school slightly better than it was the day before? Mm. Is Or my relationship slightly better? Or, or is teaching and learning slightly better? Are our pupils slightly more knowledgeable and slightly better for that day in school? So, you know, it's it's a fabulous, it's a fabulous motto. It is. And I think we could all live by it, yeah. irrespective. This is cool. So, like, we are just in the process of solidifying our mission, our vision, what our core values are as a company, what the next 10 years, five years, three years, one year, quarter looks like. So we're, we're, we're deep in the middle of it all. We're reading all the books. Would you say that those, um, those three things, be ready, be kind, be long, would you say that they reflect values in your own life? Yes, because I think you talk about leadership. The key thing, the best leaders that I was ever involved with in any way, shape or form would not would model, model for you. There's no way that I would sit in an office pontificating to others and expecting others to do things that I wouldn't be prepared to do myself. Mm -hmm. um, I, it happened through cricket. It happened through you know my parents. It happened through everybody who's been an influence in my life. And mm. it's interesting to talk about, you know, your strategy. Last night we had a governor's meeting and we've just, you know, passed our new three-year school development plan. And what we did was we traced it right back to those three Bs. Mm. So they were our, we came up with a, a statement under each of those that we wanted to be the focus for the next three years. We tied them in with 
you know, the new quality improvement strategy through the inspectorate. And then we looked at our whole school priorities and then we actioned the whole thing out. But the, the key thing for me is whenever I'm faced with a decision in school, I keep going back to the North Star of does this fit with our vision as a school? Mm. So, um, you know, there are opportunities to cut corners or opportunities to look at do things. And I would say, does that fit our mission statement? Does it sit with the ethos of our school? And if the answer is no, we don't do it. Mm. Simple as that. Awesome. Well, I'm a big believer in uh, the path becoming clear as you start walking it. So I'm going to take the rest of our time together and I'm going to go through the three Bs. Oh, cool. We'll do that. Yeah, let's do that. So that. let's um, bring as many stories, bring as many things from your own life into it. But uh, what in your life taught you to be ready and what does that mean for you? My parents. Yeah. Um, significant influences in my life, significant people in my life. Um, a guy called John Solanke who I met was my first real cricket coach. Um, right through to a guy, Adrian Burrell, who was the national coach of the Cricket Ireland team that took us. Look, the truth of the matter, I suppose, when it comes to beer, I'll, I'll talk about Eddie. Uh, I had been, to, to, talk, to talk about my story, and there's a lot of talk out there in schools and in society about pupils and, and young people and resilience. And I think for us to be fair to pupils, and we have a be kind story in here, and a belong story in here. But some of the decisions we make in school might in the immediate short term be seen as you're not being very kind to me here. Mm. Because it's tough love and certainly what happens in my house at home. Sometimes there are things that I do with my children that I hate doing, but I'm doing it for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. And Eddie, Eddie changed my outlook in life. Um, I'd been a successful cricketer throughout it. And yeah, he he basically asked, the, you know, he, he outlined a vision when he arrived that Ireland were going to play test cricket. And we all sat in the room nudging each other saying this man's <laughs> lost the plot completely. But what he did was he just shifted a mindset. He made us think way beyond the small world that we had been living in. So we were happy to be the guys who swapped shirts with international teams when they came to play Ireland. That was, you know, who did a swap a shirt to say I played against, whereas he was basically saying, you're as good as and you can beat these guys. And it took him a long time to piece that all together. But all of a sudden, he changed a group of teachers Farmers, carpet salesmen, postmen, you name it. And also ran Ragbag, went to World Cup in 2007 and beat Pakistan, went to the Super 8s, beat Bangladesh. And all of a sudden we were on Sky Sports. And when I think of the lessons that he taught me about being ready, and a lot of it stemmed right back down to my outlook in life. My outlook in life, my value of myself and how I saw myself. I always saw others as better and better. And, and all of a sudden when you part it back, you realise that actually they're not. It was just my vision of myself, my, my look at myself, and that little Northern Ireland inferiority complex mm. maybe, the fact that just because somebody's got a Pakistan badge on their cricket jersey, they're better than I am. And it took me right through the halfway through the World Cup to realise actually, I'm everybody as good as these guys. Um, so one of the things about being ready is making sure our kids in school understand the size of the world and the opportunities in the world and their ability to change the world. Mm. And that's, that for me is a big, big piece. You know, it, it's more than, of course, listen, the currency in schools is grades. Of course it is. And I'm not shying away from that one bit. But there's lots more to it than that. And I keep saying, you know, you know, Peter Weir is our head of PA and looks after rugby. And I keep telling him that sometimes if the guys are getting beaten, I keep telling them, stop worrying about the rugby. You're actually shaping lives more than you'll ever know through the vehicle of rugby. Mm -hmm. and, in, and, in, and in my way, you know, there's only one school can win a school's cup every year. So there's 20 boys will have a medal. But I want our boys to be better. And, and through school in general, I want our pupil, mm -hmm. every pupil that comes through the doors of our college to be better off for having been there. Yeah. It's interesting you talked earlier about how you have to, leadership is something you have to model. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can't just sit back and direct. You have to kind of get in. And you're talking about you want the kids in school to be aware of the opportunities that are out there. Mm -hmm. um, one of our favourite quotes it's just up there in that bookcase it says you can't be what you can't see yeah. and so you have to be that role model You, the teachers have to be that role model and then you, you have to bring people in as well to kind of show that path there's a great quote uh, by a guy called John Wooden um, he's a basketball guy isn't basketball he? coach UCLA basketball coach and there's a great TED talk on YouTube okay. which I am inspired by but the quote that he has is and I'll let me get this right for you um, no written word no spoken plea can teach our youth what they should be, nor all the books and all the shells 
but what the teachers are themselves. And I would, I, you know, there you, like I, I've just, you'd think I had it written in front of me here. But for me, I think that's a really, really powerful thing. You know, we can have all the books, we can have all the IT equipment, we can have the best of the facilities, we can have everything. But actually at the heart of this, and it goes right back to what I said about Richard Branson, schools are pupil-centered. We, we want to focus on, we, Lurgan College is a special school. It's, it's a small school, it's 470 odd pupils. We know each pupil by name. We, you know, we know them all, what makes them tick. But the bottom line is, you can do that. But if you know, and we can have the best of teaching strategies, we can have the best of equipment. But if there's no relationship there, mm. and if the pupils don't believe that you, you know, are going to be kind to them, that you love them, that you want the best for them, well, I think you're you're rowing against the tide there. Absolutely. So I think it's really important that as as people, you walk the talk. Mm -hmm. How did you learn in your life to be kind? Um, good question. I suppose there'd be many times in life than than it, than it probably wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, looking at the example that others set me, I'm looking at some of the things that people did for me. Yeah, all of a sudden, when you maybe get to my age, realise just what the, the the time and the effort and the commitment that people poured in to allow me the the experience life as I'm living living it now. We're really young parents that we have a three year old and a three month old, and the. It is being heaped upon me in massive amounts every single day where I say, you ungrateful wee boy. <laughs> you had no idea the amount that everybody did for you, like, mm -hmm. you know. Well, I joke, you know, we, Lynn and I have Matthew, who's 10. He's in P7. And then we were blessed with twin girls. And it was only when we had twins that we that we realized how many other people had twins. And I, You're part of the, fr the twin <laughs> fraternity all of a sudden. So all of a sudden, and, and we have twins in school, and I always joke with them, when you go home, you give your parents a hug mm. and you tell them how much you love them because you have no idea yeah. what you have put yeah. them through. And you know the dishwasher and make sure oh. you also do. <laughs> but that's the joy of parenthood, you know. Um, and in many respects, we talk about the pastoral care in schools, but I genuinely see myself as a father figure in schools. Sure. Because ultimately people, you, there's nothing greater when I leave my kids to Moelan Primary School that I know that they're looked after in there. And when you think of the responsibility of that, you know, people are, are, are entrusting their flesh and blood with us and they spend a significant amount of time with us and we have a significant role to play. And I think, you know, one of the great frustrations that I have at the minute is that education seems to have fallen off the radar in terms of, you know, political importance. And we are the catch-all for a lot of society's ills. And we play such an important role that one of my frustrations is that you hear about climate change. We hear, of, and I'm not saying it's not important, but we, we, we look at the situation with our own government at, at the moment. We look at the state of the health service and so on. And nobody mentions education. Mm. I've just told you, I've just left school and I've had a leak in the roof. And genuinely, there's no money in the system to fix anything. Yeah. Um, and the role, the key role that schools play and the key roles that not just teachers, non-teaching staff, your ancillary staff, your classroom assistants, your cleaners, your your caretakers. In our school, every, every member, it's it's not there's not a teaching staff and a non-teaching staff. Everybody plays a key role throughout mm -hmm. the day. We quiet word from the caretaker yep. in the corridor about something that he saw at the at the sport and sorry, the girls' hockey one and sorry, well done, great. Those small little things, mm -hmm. those small little words, you, we we underestimate. I think the power of that, and it's only we we had our hundred and fiftieth anniversary last year and we had three big events one of them was where we opened the doors of school and we had an open morning and former pupils came and I was really taken by the conversations that I had with pupils who had gone 50 years ago and they could still remember the conversations that it, the, the wee quiet words or the little things that happened in that classroom mm. and I spoke to the staff about it afterwards because we often I think it's a Northern Ireland thing I spoke about my career we downplay the good we do Mm -hmm. We're too modest, and we we the good we do we downplay, and then we beat ourselves up over the the small mistakes that we make. Mm -hmm. So it's learning to not over egg the mistakes, and actually take time to sit back and take great pride and yeah in the lives you've shaped. Do you think education has fallen off the agenda because is there almost a an element of complacency because Northern Ireland has such great education in comparison to other places around the world? Is there a place where maybe we're sitting on our laurels a wee bit, or do you think it's something else? Um, I think a lot of it is down to the, the, the sheer passion and the vocation of the workforce. Mm -hmm. And I think because teachers continue to go so far above and beyond for the pupils that that's now taken for granted. Right. And, and I think it's got this stage now where 
it's no longer being taken for granted. Uh, and, and or sorry, the, the goodwill is starting to ebb because when when you say there's nothing left to give. Yeah. Now I've obviously taught uh, I taught in Grosvenor Grammar School in East Belfast for seventeen years before I went to Lurgan College, and I can categorically state here and now that certainly over the last seven years and eight years in Lurgan College, there is not one teacher in that school that I don't believe gives their everything. Uh, and for me, I think that irons over a lot of the problems that is that you know, you know, teachers are spending their own money. To, to decorate their rooms, they're spending their own money for pupils. Teachers will, you know, I, I can tell you stories about, you know, what teachers provide for pupils who need it. It's because the system doesn't provide for them mm. enough. It does provide, no, it, uh, but it doesn't provide enough. Mm. And I think schools do an incredible job and school leaders do an incredible job countrywide. Yeah. On a pupil level, what does be kind mean? You know, obviously, how, maybe a better question is, how do you inspire action around that message on a people level? We iterate the message over and over again. Mm -hmm. um, it's in student plan. It's a, but the bottom line is we are very fortunate. Our school community and the pupils in it are brilliant. You know, I tell the story about when I started in the college, you know, I came in at lunchtime, there were two sixth form girls redecorating my room. So I just thought your room could do it being spruced up. And I thought, yeah. work, work away girls, yeah. you know. Um, our pupils are incredible but it's just enshrining that message that all relationships and all interactions in school are rooted in kindness and i think the kids when they hear that if there's something if there's somebody who step, steps outside of that it's very easy for you to say well you know are you is what you've just done an act of kindness mm -hmm. and it's very simple for us and i talk about the north star it's very easy to go back and say was that was that in you know was that in accordance with the ethos of our school mm -hmm. And they can't really argue with it in most cases. But we also celebrate those act of ki acts of kindness as well. Mm -hmm. And I think recognizing, it, I think little things, you know, you talk about leadership. If a head of department has taken the time to send me minutes, which they, and you look at them and there's three or four pages, very detailed, they've spent a lot of time and effort and energy and thought in that. I like to acknowledge that where I I'll clearly read the minutes but I'll acknowledge it in an email return. I'll make mention and I'll make note of some of the points that I've made say that I've noted it and then acting upon it. Um, I think that's an act of kindness because you're showing a genuine interest. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not a false interest in them. It's not a contrived interest. You know, ultimately, I, I was always taken by Nelson Mandela used the phrase Ubuntu, Ubuntu pardon my pronunciation, but it was, you know, um, I am because we are. Mm. And ultimately, as as a principal of a school, I can't. You, you're not the hero head anymore. It's not you at the top. It can only be done through distributed leadership and belief and and, and upskilling, and and capacity building of everybody in the school, pupils and staff. Yeah. How do you do the delicate dance between? We had a, a guy in here a couple of days ago, and he talked about uh, the rod versus the staff. <laughs> right. So you talk about you need to encourage and celebrate. Good behavior, and then there needs to be a corrective element to that. How do you strike that balance in a school environment? I think that's the art, isn't it? That's the art. We we focus obviously the stick has to, there have to be parameters, and if somebody steps outside of those parameters, we have to have a, a you know we, it's specifically called the promoting positive behavior policy. Uh -huh. Everything we do is an attempt to promote positive behavior, but mm. there are occasions when there's behavior that's not in accordance with what we stand for. But it has to. For me, it's dealing with the problem, not the person. That we're dealing with that issue, not the individual. We're smiling because Daniel came up with something amazing this morning. Do you mind if I share it real quick? So uh, we do a morning meeting every day. One of the things as part of that, we talk about issues. What were the issues that came up yesterday? Oh, the mic or oh, this or the camera or whatever. And Daniel came up with something class, right? He says, this is the order we should address issues with, okay? Is it a, now this is obviously for us as a business, is it a product problem? So is it a problem with the actual thing we're selling? Okay, if the answer's no, we move on to the next P. He calls it the three Ps. This is brand new, I swear. We'll use this you every day for the rest of our lives. the three Ps. Yeah, yeah, Very yeah, good. three Very Ps, good. three Ps. Title of the podcast, there you go. Like, subscribe. And uh, <laughs> so if it's not a problem with the, pro with the product, then, not, then you look at the process. Is it a problem with the process? And if it's not a problem with the process, then you go to the last bit, and that's the person. Mm -hmm. Is it a problem with the person? And... I just saw it. Daniel Roska is 19 years old and he has just become, a, like that's the title of his TED Talk in five years, you know what I mean? Well, 
Well, it's funny, and apologies for looking it up on my phone now. I sent a senior leader in school a message last night. We were talking about invitation. I, I went to him about invitational theory, Novak and Perky's invitational theory in education. And they talk about key elements mm -hmm. in schools, you know, care, trust, respect, optimism, and intentionality. And I think as a leader, if you if you model that, <laughs> that that's that's key. But he then talks about the domains, the key domains. And there's five P's. So I'm gonna I'm oh, gonna I'm gonna, I'm gonna see your I'm gonna see your three and I'm gonna up them to five. Like you know, he talks about people, mm -hmm. places, policies, programs, and processes. Nice. And when you break it down into all of those, the, the whole thing for me is there are people in school and people in life who I think are intentionally uninviting. Mm -hmm. I think <laughs> deliberately, there are people who are unintentionally uninviting. I mm -hmm. want to be intentionally inviting in school. I want Lurgan College to be an inviting school. So, you know, little things, subtleties about the messages, uh, no entry, mm. you know, no entry or no parking. Yeah. That, as opposed to, you know, you, you can subtly change the, the wording of that, you know, yeah. um, to please use. Mm -hmm. I think that's an intentional message that you can give that, you know, when I talk about people, we look at our places, so we're trying to develop our, our school environment. We look at our policies and our processes in school to see are they effective and efficient and, and, and our program through the curriculum or whatever way you want to put sure. it. So I sent, funny, I sent that to Al very good. Alistair Hamill, who's a senior teacher last night. I Class. just said, have you seen Novak and Perky's invitational theory? Yeah. Because we were talking about shared education, actually. Yeah which um, is something very close to my heart. What is the Dixon Plan? You mentioned it at the very top of the show. Yeah, so Dixon Plan's unique. Um, so there's a lot of debate in, in policy circles now about academic selection at 11. Uh, the use of what was the old 11 plus. Now it went to the AQE. It's now going to the, I think it's SEAG, SEAG. Well, we're very different. Um, so uh, primary, we basically transfer at 14. It's a system of delayed transfer delayed academic selection, really. So basically pupils, instead of doing the transfer at, at P7, um, they transfer seamlessly to what's called a junior high school and they do key stage three in a junior high school. And then over the course of those three years, they follow a curriculum uh, and then they're assessed over time mm -hmm. in all of their subjects. And then that creates a rank order. And then they transfer at 14 to hopefully a school that's most suited to them. By the time they're 14, we hope that they're better able to make a decision that, you know what, I want to follow the academic route and yeah. that is suited to my, you know, suited to me, or I'm going to go down a vocational route and I'll go down a less, you know, uh, it's not a less worthwhile route at all. Sure. Um, in fact, what we, what we find is in, in the system, it allows pupils to find their path. I look at my son, who's P7 and who will go, my wife teaches in, in the junior high school in Tandergay. Um, Matthew will go there. I look at him now as a wee P7 boy and think, is he, would he be ready to make it? And I, I'm very comfortable that at 14 he'll be, we'll, we'll, and him and us as a family will be more understanding of where he's more suited to. And yeah. then he will elect or select to go to a school that's most yeah. suited to him. So we're the senior end of that. So we're the grammar side of that. So, um, and then if, if they don't come to Learn College, they, they go to Craig Avenue Senior High School. Yeah. Awesome. I just want to go back to something on, under the Be Kind. I really loved how, um, you were talking a little bit about that corrective element and it was, does your behavior align with the values of the school? Does it align with the North Star of the school? Mm -hmm. And the clarity of having a North Star, the clarity of having a thing on the blazer that says follow better things, the clarity of having be ready, be kind, be long, is you've just got so much clarity in there. Mm -hmm. And as you say, like... And, and and Daniel's process too. Like we, there was an issue this morning, and we ran it through. And the answers are obvious. You can't wiggle out of it. Mm. It it's actually that was a, that was a people problem. You yeah. know, I dropped the ball. Matthew dropped the ball. And there, there's no way. There's you can't deny it. And you almost don't even have to come in heavy handed because it's yeah. like it's so clear. And you know the other thing you've just maybe it, it is, and it's my north star. And when I started into the role, I thought when I finish, whenever that time may be, what do I? want to be remembered by what do I want my legacy to be and I wanted it I wanted people to have something to hold me to mm. and you talk about there you drop the ball I think it's vitally important in leadership that you own it mm. when you drop the ball because my goodness me mm -hmm. you drop the ball all the time yeah. uh, and you don't get it right all the time and the, the willingness and the ability to be vulnerable enough to say do you know what I got that wrong I'm very sorry about that mm. I think is a very powerful trait of effective leadership because I think the some might have a tendency to try and conceal that, hide it, 
see it as a, I'm, I love the work of Stephen Covey, mm. uh, the seven habits of effective people. Um, but for me, it's the, just the ownership of it mm. to, to say, and I got that wrong. I'm sorry. Yeah. And he talked about the emotional bank. So if you make enough deposits in people, you know, by, by those little kind acts of kindness, by those little recognitions and you build up that trust, you keep making deposits with your staff, that'll build up so that when you make a mistake, mm. you eat into your, you, you eat into your account. I love that. And so long as you don't make nuclear mistakes or you know, you would be in if I was having to say sorry to staff on a daily basis, they'd be saying, Well, this guy's incompetent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So so long as you're not making nuclear mistakes on a on a day by day basis. Yeah, don't go into your overdraft. And don't go into your overdraft. <laughs> I think it's very important to keep building up that emotional bank account. It's class. You know, and, and I was taken by Kobe and that Kobeism. I just thought, you know, yeah. that's really important. Because without trust, trust is the emotional glue that holds everything together. Mm. If I don't trust my staff and they don't trust me, forget about it. Mate, this is magic. I'm loving it. <laughs> Absolutely loving it. Okay, be long. Where will we go? Let's go. Um, was there ever a point in your life where you felt like you didn't belong? Yeah. And I'm gonna go. I'm gonna talk about international cricket. Let's do it. it took me a long time to realise that I belonged on that stage. I spent too much of my career with an inferior. So I'll give you an example. Um, I went on trial to a couple of counties, uh, to Derbyshire uh, and to Surrey, and it didn't work out. And I'll be honest with you, because when I went there, I was looking around me at all these other people, and I had them away up here and myself somehow, that we know the Ireland mentality. And that's my one, I don't have regrets, because I think your life is plotted out for you. Sure. But if I could do cricket again, I would I would look at Niall O'Brien, and I look at a lot of Ed Joyce, and these guys that I played cricket with who made it at the highest level. And I think I wish I had your self-belief. Mm. And I almost, I wish I had your vision mm -hmm. to actually see outside of club cricket, Irish cricket, to, to, to try. It. And thankfully now, through our team, I think we, we, we paved the way. Irish cricketers are now playing test cricket and they're playing on the world stage and they're getting paid handsomely to, yeah. to enjoy it. Would I want to go back and do it? No. I'm, I was really content with, with my own journey and my own role in that. But I didn't belong in my own head and in my own skin until probably halfway through the 2007 World Cup, when all of a sudden I was hearing Sky Sports commentators talking about Kyle McCallum being one of the best off spinners in the competition and, and up there with the best in the world. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at Graham Swan. I'm thinking, I'm every, bit as, I'm every bit as good as him. Yeah. But it took me to, I was, what, 32, to realise that. <clears throat> and when I retired, I could have played on, but I had my reasons, and I'll maybe talk about them later, but... I retired knowing that I could I could mix it with the best of them. But if I had known that, I know I'd had a county cricket career. But I firmly believe a county cricket career wasn't what I was meant to to, to enjoy. And therefore, I made my way in Irish cricket. Mm -hmm. And I don't regret it one bit. Okay. Let's go there now. We may as well while we're here. Mm -hmm. Why, what, what made you step back? So, um, 2009, there was a World Cup in India in 2011. And the quite the, the, I was one of these guys that made the very most of whatever limited talent I had been given. And uh, there were things that had happened in, in my life. My father had been diagnosed with cancer of, uh, called multiple myeloma. And uh, that was one. Uh, there was going to be career opportunities outside of cricket in, in school. A head of department and PE was going to come up. And I felt that I couldn't do that if I was going to commit to cricket. And Lynn and I had been struggling to have a family. And we really wanted to try and prioritise having a family. And um, the truth of the matter is I prayed about it. And I knew the answer. And I got an email from Cricket Ireland in September, October, about a training camp in Brady. And when I opened it, my initial reaction was, and as that, that instant, mm. I made the decision, I'm done. Wow. And, and I stepped back uh, simply because my, I only got where I could get because I invested everything I had in it. And I felt that if I was half invested or 75% invested, I wouldn't be the cricketer I needed and wanted to be. And the truth of the matter was that was that was my reaction. And I remember vividly watching a documentary. I don't know when it was, and I don't know where. I think it was in Kenya. There was a documentary about the Chapel Brothers, the famous Chapel Brothers from Australia. And one of them was qu quoted 
retire when people are asking why you're retiring <laughs> rather than retire when people are asking why you're not retiring. That's so funny. And I wanted to go out when people thought, why is he doing that? Yeah. And they thought highly of me at that time. And I did a retired, pro I could have gone to the World Cup in India and is it a regret? I'd have loved to have experienced cricket in India. Sure. But my mum and dad had played a pivotal role in me. They'd followed me all around the world and they'd supported me throughout my entire career. And I felt it was my time to support them. Sure. That was it. On the school level then, be long. What does that mean? Simple, I want every member of our school community to feel a, a, a strong sense of belonging. What does that mean? That they have an attachment to the school, mm -hmm. not just during their time there, but for every breathing minute they have, that they have fond memories, that they have a real strong sense of belonging to something, a, com a really special community. But it means more than that as well. I want Lurgan College to, to, to be a part of the wider community. Um, I talked about shared ed earlier. Again, the funding for that has been slashed. But Lurgan as a town has a lot of healing to do. And I want Lurgan College to play a role in bringing, you know, I think as educationalists, we've got to have a, a vision for the future mm -hmm. of Northern Ireland. And I want Lurgan College to play a role in, in reconciliation, if you want to call it that. Mm -hmm. But bringing everybody together. We, we're a non-denominational grammar school. We welcome every colour, creed, religion under the sun. And we're a controlled school. And unfortunately, you know, people what think... What does that mean? What is controlled? Well, you, you know, people see con, con, <laughs> controlled school as Protestant schools, and we're not. We're open to all. And we want we're, we want to welcome all. Um, and I'm excited about, despite the challenges of the lack of funding, I, I want us to model, be ready, be kind, and belong in our community, and whether that be us going out to the community, but also getting the community in. You know, we have the Rotary Club in, we have Just One Life, we have shared ed projects, we, we, we do shared history trips. We, and I just think, again, it's opening, it's opening kids' eyes. You know, we do, whether we like it or not. We live in little enclaves and we live, and it's letting people see the big world, world out there mm. that I've been fortunate enough to experience in, a, in, in many respects. And I feel that acutely. Yeah. Brilliant. Pupil level. How does belong? How, again, not how does it play out. How do you, as a leadership team, try to stoke up that value on a people level? Well, we have a massive house system in school. So you're... Hogwarts style. Uh, so you go into four houses, you know, the four former uh, original principals of school, Bulger Khan, Harper Kirkpatrick, and we have a very strong house system and house competition. structure. So we want pupils, as soon as they come in, they feel a sense of belonging to their house. And then from that, we hope to foster a sense of belonging to the school through participate. You know, again, participation not just in the classroom. It's those. You know, learning happens in the corridor. It learning. It happens in the sports pitch. It happens in the you know the, the music rooms and drama studios. Our SU in school is huge. You know, we've a, a third of the school on a Tuesday afternoon in the hall. Um, so it's it's providing a hook for every pupil and providing something in school for every pupil to, to find an attachment and a sense of, I want to be a part of that. Because ultimately, I just look back at my school and sport happened to be mine. Mm -hmm. And what I learned through sport actually got me through my exams. It got me to university. And I often laugh, you know, my old history teacher, Nan Caldwell, I hope she's listening. Her husband was the chairman in the end of Cricket Ireland, but I think Nan must have looked at me at A-level history and just thought, this guy's an absolute balloon. Because <laughs> I think I failed every assessment in history right through to my A-levels when I actually got a B. Um, and it was really, that was massive for me. But I, I often think of, what must, Nan wrote me a lovely card when I got the job. And I often think, if you'd have gone back 25 years, I thought, he's going to be a leader in a school. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but it just goes to show you. I have a real close friend, Andy Gibson, who's a pastor of CFC Church, who was a PE teacher with me in Grover. He just said, "Kyle, everybody's on their journey." Hmm. That was his way saying, "Everybody's on their journey," and I just want everybody in Learning College on their journey to to be able to look back and think of those three th those three things. Hmm. Class. <laughs> <laughs> what an accidental format that was. That was epic. Yeah. Really, really enjoyed that. Just going to close with a couple of stock questions. Uh, if you could take anyone from Northern Ireland out for a cup of coffee, dead or alive, who would you take and where would you take them and why? Jeepers, I could take many. And when I sat down and thought about this one, there's a gentleman and he is a gentleman and unfortunately he's no longer with us. He was the Irish cricket manager, Roy Torrance. Roy died from COVID, during COVID. 
and it broke our hearts on so many levels because Roy was like my father. He was a cricket manager and he was the Irish cricket manager right throughout our time. But Roy was much more than a, a manager of a cricket team. He was everything to us. And one of the great shame, it, Roy could have filled St. Anne's Cathedral for his funeral. And we went to the Ballywillan Road and stood on the side of the road as the funeral cortege went past with 20 people at his funeral. And I would love to take Roy out for a coffee or probably something stronger <laughs> um, in his beloved Port Hotel and laugh about all those great, the practical jokes we played on him, the practical jokes he played on us <laughs> and the laughs that we had. And just to thank him for that, because I don't know if, well, I think he knew that. I think he knew that. I just regretted the fact that I never had the opportunity to really, hmm. um, to really tell him. And he was taken in those tragic circumstances. And if I could, yeah, I thought he was probably the one that I would love to take out for, because there are, listen, I could write, he could write a book and I could write a book about simply the laughs that we had. He was an incredible man. And he was like, he was a father figure to us in the cricket team. And he lived in Portrush and he had driven to Cork wouldn't charge any, never cost a penny. He did it purely for the love of cricket and for the love of the guys involved in it. And Phil Simmons, Eddie Burrell, and all those coaches that, that he was the manager of their teams would tell you that he was the sounding board. He was the, the he kept everybody right. A mm. wise man, a funny man. We used to joke, we called him the con man because he, <laughs> he had told a lie to cut you. But we had the best relationship with him. And so I would love to, to get one more opportunity to go for coffee with him. It's great. If you could go back in a time machine to an 18-year-old version of yourself, what sort of things would you be saying? Believe in yourself much more than I think I've alluded to that already. I wouldn't change a thing. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't change a thing because I do believe that your journey is mapped out for you. I do believe there's a greater authority that's, that's directing my paths. I'd love to go back and in hindsight, but actually... That has made me who I am mm -hmm. and everything I do today. So I wouldn't change it. So what would I say to me, a 10-year-old self? Enjoy it. Love that. <laughs> Final question. Gut reaction, first thing comes into your head. The The correct answer is impossible, by the way. It's a, it's a, it's a question that makes no sense. Um, what's the kindest thing that someone's ever done for you? Goodness. Kindest thing someone's ever done for me. Been there. I would say simply being there. Because knowing that they're there and that you, you might not have a question or, or anything for them, but just knowing that they're there, that you can go to them. And I'm, I'm talking about my per I'm talking about everybody, my parents, my wife, the all these significant. There have been so many people who have shaped my life and I've been surrounded by so many wonderful people. They undoubtedly, you talk about nature and nurture. I think there's nature there, but there's nurture too. And I've had, I look back in life and, I, and in education, you see some kids who have a, a, their, their cards have been dealt, you know, been dealt a tough hand and they, they often make it and it's wonderful to see, but they've made it because there are other people in their lives, significant others in their lives that, that shape them. So for me, yeah, just being there. Love it. Well, keep on following better things. Amen. That was awesome. Thank you, Kyle. Really appreciate it. Pleasure, Matthew.